Hi, my name is Chloe Reverie, and I am a cruciverbalist, someone who enjoys making or solving crossword puzzles. It's a more popular hobby than you might think. Here's a picture of the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, where every year in Stamford, Connecticut, cruciverbalists compete against each other to find the person who can solve the assigned puzzles fastest and with the fewest mistakes. It's like a grown-up SAT, but people do it for fun. I'd really like to compete, but the truth is I'm not that good at solving puzzles, but I can code. And thus was born an idea. I would write an algorithm that solves crossword puzzles, but where to even begin? Luckily, as a cruciverbalist, I knew some secrets of the trade that could help me in my quest. For starters, crossword constructors are notorious plagiarists. In 2016, a programmer named Saul Ponson discovered widespread plagiarism in the crossword community including several instances of direct plagiarism of clues, themes, and grid layouts. But there was also unintentional plagiarism. Because of the structure of the English language, constructors often find themselves relying heavily on certain words. Here are the 10 words that most frequently appear in American crossword puzzles. Notice all the vowels. Now, not only do these words appear all the time, but they often appear with the exact same clues. For example, the clue eerie has appeared in crosswords thousands of times, but 20% of those times, it appears with one of only five clues in this exact wording. It turns out constructors can be really lazy. And I wondered, how much of a crossword puzzle could I solve simply by cross-referencing its clues with a historical clue database? I decided to write an algorithm to find out. Just like a human solver, the algorithm needs two pieces of input to do its work, the grid layout and the clues. And because there's no standard way to represent a puzzle programmatically, we get to represent this data however we want. Since the data to represent a grid layout looks very different from the data that represents the clues, I settled on two separate file formats. In the grid file, the first line is the puzzle dimensions. For readability, the rest of the file simply visually translates the puzzle, with hashes for black squares and periods for blank ones. When it's finished, the puzzle should look like this. The clues are a text file where the first two numbers are the xy position of the clue in the grid. The third number is the direction of the clue, 0 for horizontal and 1 for vertical. The rest of the line is the clue text. Once we established a format for the clue data, it was easy to compare it with the historical database of clues. So how much of the puzzle can be solved through this approach? It turns out to be a whopping 30%. So our puzzle has gone from this to this. Much better. But we still have to solve the other 70%, and that means we're going to need a way to generate answers for the remaining clues. Luckily, I know just the tool. AI is a magical tool that solves all of your problems. Just kidding. Actually, AI is often good at solving very specific, well-defined problems. And unfortunately, crossword puzzle clues differ widely in format, meaning, and style. Just how widely? I was able to identify several different clue categories. Here's a sample. Because there's no one-size-fits-all solution we can use to generate answers for all these different types of clues, we need to use a different approach for each clue type. So I wrote a program that classifies clues based on heuristics I know are commonly used by constructors, so we can use a different approach to solve each one. For example, if we see the clue love in Lyon, we can classify it as non-English because it contains a non-English word, place, or name. Now that we have this in place, we can use a different API or strategy to generate the answers. Here's a sample of some of the approaches I used. You're probably wondering what's up with puns. It turns out computers are good at math, but not so good at humor. I'm several PhDs short of figuring out how to solve this problem, so I just skipped over it. Now that we've generated possible answers for every clue, we can use what we already know to winnow down our answer set. So imagine that we have these possible answers for these clues of this length. First, we can remove all the answers that aren't the exact right length for the clue. So goodbye Serena, which is not five characters. Next, we discard the answers that don't fit with the 30% of the grid we already know. Let's imagine that that disqualifies bake. So now we have a much narrower set of answers to play with. 
And to get the solution to the puzzle, all we need to do is mash together every possible answer with every other possible answer until we get a grid that works. There's just one problem with that. Even a small crossword turns out to be pretty big, and there are just too many combinations to efficiently brute force this problem. Luckily, people who are really good at math have been working on this problem for decades. They've even given it a name. Boolean satisfiability problem. This is a class of problems in which the goal is to find an assignment for a large number of variables, such that an overall formula evaluates to true. The formula can be as simple as x and y equals true. The satisfiability problem in this case is to find Boolean values, true or false, for x and y that make the equation true. Once you express a problem as a Boolean equation, you can run it through a SAT solver for satisfiability, an algorithm designed to solve this class of problems. So how can we turn our partially filled grid and our set of possible answers into a Boolean equation? We start by imagining that each square in the crossword puzzle is its own variable. Since we've already generated a list of possible values for every square, we have a starting set of possible values for each variable. For example, if we know that one across is either bead or drop, square x1 must contain either d or b. So now we can write a Boolean equation that represents all the possible values for one across like this. This statement says that one across must be either bead or drop. Each variable has a special notation to make it more human readable. It contains the row and column number of the square and a possible value to fill it. If we feed this expression into a SAT solver algorithm, such as zchaff, it will output something like this, telling us that the solution to the puzzle for one across is bead. When I applied this formula to the entire puzzle and ran it through the SAT solver algorithm, bam, I got a pretty filled puzzle. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good for an unthinking machine. I call it the Griddler. But the Griddler is still trapped inside my computer, unable to manifest in the physical world and compete against people. So to bring it to life, I called in a friend. The Pen Plotter. Before there was the toner printer, people used these plotters to draw detailed designs on paper. It's essentially a programmable robotic arm with a pen attached. Nowadays, the business world has moved on but I happened to have access to a fashionably vintage pen plotter from the 80s. I realized I could use it to transcribe the filled puzzle onto paper after the algorithm solved it. The only problem? This plotter uses a domain-specific language called HPGL, Hewlett Packard Graphics Language. It's not much fun. Here's the HPGL to draw a single line across the page. We initialize, select pen one from the repository, Move it to position absolute 9090 in the upper left of the page. Put the pen down to start drawing. Move the pen to position absolute 9900 at the right side of the page. Pick the pen up to stop drawing. And finally, put the pen back in the repository. Wow, that was terrible. To avoid writing any more HPGL than absolutely necessary, I wrote a Python library that converts puzzle files, blank, partially filled, or fully filled, to HPGL and it turned out to be only marginally less terrible than the original HPGL. Here's a sample, how you write the letter S. So after spending an entire day relearning how to write the alphabet, I was finally able to put everything together. Here's a video of the Griddler at work. So the plotter has interpreted the grid format and is recreating it on the page, including the black squares. The pen plotter got tired at this point and had to nap. But once I woke it up again, it used that nifty library I wrote to fill in the letters too. So what's next for the Griddler? Well, the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, where the Griddler will be competing remotely. Thank you for listening and take care.